So we've got our five number summary, the min, Q1, median, Q3, and max. Notice those are in ascending order from left to right. Starts with the min, all those numbers get bigger until you get to the max. First blank there is just the next thing we're talking about, which is a box plot. It says the five number summary divides the distribution roughly into quarters. This leads to a new way to display quantitative data. And that's totally true. You can think about it as being 25% of the data, 25% of the data, 25% of the data, 25% of the data. So we can look at those data uh, in quarters. So how do you make a box plot other than being able to draw a box in straight lines? Uh, the first blank, we need a central box. And to draw that box, we're going to use Q1 and Q3. We're just going to put straight lines at Q1 and Q3 and draw a box around it. So a central box using Q1 and Q3, kind of like that. There's Q1, there's Q3. Make a box. Uh, the next thing, we need a line in the middle that marks the median. So let's put a line wherever the median is. It doesn't have to be in the middle. It's just wherever the median falls between Q1 and Q3. So it doesn't have to be in the middle, but it has to be in the box somewhere. And then we have lines called whiskers that extend from the box out to the smallest and largest observations that are not the outliers. So out to the biggest one that's not an outlier and out to the smallest one that's not an outlier. So we have a whisker going this way and maybe a whisker going this way all the way out to the biggest observations that aren't outliers because for the outliers we save something special we usually use asterisks for those so if I have an outlier up here I'd put an asterisk or an outlier here I'd put an asterisk so that's all it is to make a box plot we need the five number summary and then we need to pay special attention to where some outliers might be we'll use asterisks for those so if we had to line it up with the min, the Q1, the median. So the min, Q1, the median. We know we make our box with Q1 and Q3. Median goes in the middle or somewhere between Q1 and Q3. It doesn't have to be exactly in the middle. Then we have the min. And then the max, I can actually move the max down here. The max is the, obviously the biggest number. So in this case, I can move the max over to whatever this outlier is. So this whisker would stop at the largest non-outlier. The largest non-outlier. And then sometimes if the biggest one's an outlier, the max would be down there at one of the asterisks. All right, so let me scroll down here. Example 3 says compare the distributions of the McDonald's data using box plots. And we're actually going to make a couple parallel box plots that use the same x-axis for the scale. So let's start with our axis. I think we can get everything within 50 grams of fat. So let's start from 0 to 50. Cut that in half, you get 25. And let's cut that down to increments of 5. And we're going to put both box plots on this axis. OK, so what do we need to make these box plots? Well, I think we've already got it. We need to know what the min, the Q1, the median, the Q3, and the max. We need the five number summary for each group. So for the beef, the five number summary for the beef, the smallest one from the beef, I think, was 9. And then the Q1 was 21, the median 26, Q3 29, the max was 43. So there's our five number summary for the beef sandwiches. We've got the min, the Q1 median, Q3, and the max. So just one quick note before we get to the fish sandwiches. Uh, this 43 is worth looking at in this case because I think if we pay close attention, that's actually an outlier. Let's go back and take a look at that data for a second. So here was our data for the beef sandwiches. 43, if we use our IQR rule, right, and we can check this, we know the IQR is 8. If we look at Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR, I think this 43, the max here, ends up being an outlier. So if we have Q3 being 29 grams and our IQR is 8, let's check the upper fence here. So we do Q3, 29, 
plus 1.5 times that IQR, which is 8, we get 41. So our upper fence would be 41. So 43 in this case would definitely be an outlier. In fact, if that beats the upper fence, right, the 43, I'll put a little asterisk next to it because that's an outlier, then our whisker should stop at the 31. That's the biggest observation that isn't an outlier. So 43 in the case is beyond that upper fence. That's going to get an asterisk. That's an outlier. 31 was the highest observation that wasn't an outlier. So that's where our whisker stops. Um, thankfully, there weren't any low outliers in the beef data, though, and you can check that. All right, so got the, we got the info for the beef data. And then before we make that box, let's go ahead and get the info for the fish. So what's the five number summary look like for the fish? So we've got our minimum. It's also 9 grams, Q1, median, Q3, and maximum. So that's our five number summary for the fish. Minimum, Q1, median, Q3, and max. Okay, and for the fish data, it turns out if you check the upper fence and the lower fence, there is one high outlier at 33. So our max value of 33 is an outlier. And if we take a look at the fish data here, so if 33 is an outlier, I'll go ahead and put an asterisk next to 33. That means our whisker would stop here at 27. 27 will be the largest value that isn't an outlier. So we'll make sure and do that when we make the actual box plot. Okay, we've got all the data here. Let's go ahead and make this box plot. So let's start with the beef five number summary. The lowest value was 9. It wasn't an outlier, so we're going to put a mark here at 9. That's where our whisker is going to stop. And then we're going to make our box with Q1 and Q3. So we got another line here at 21. And then 26 for the median. And 29 for Q3. So now we've got Q1 and Q3 down at 21 and 29. Let's go ahead and make that box shape. There's the box. And then it's going to reach out the upper whisker. Remember we said it's not going to go to 43. 43 was actually an outlier. This one actually goes to 31. It's got a short whisker here. That was the biggest observation that wasn't an outlier. And then we can go ahead and make our whiskers. And then 43, since that was an outlier, we'll put a little star, a little asterisk there. So I hope you're really good at drawing straight lines so we can keep everything truly parallel here. Let's do the fish five number summary. So Lowest value there is again 9, so we can put a line here at 9, and then Q1's at 15, median's at 19, I'll put a line there because we're going to make our box around it, and then 24.5 for Q3, let's go ahead and make that box, so there's Q1, Q3, median smack dab, now somewhere in the middle. And then our highest value that wasn't an outlier, remember we said it wasn't 33, that's actually an outlier. Our highest value that isn't an outlier was at 27. So let's go ahead and make those nice whiskers. There's our box plot, and don't forget our outlier of 33 up here. That gets an asterisk. Awesome. So we just compared these things using box plots, and that's something that's called parallel box plots, and you can see why. We compare them on the same axis here, and they are indeed parallel. So we've got a beautiful graph, but it totally lacks context. Someone just walking up and looking at this graph probably wouldn't have any idea what it meant. So let's go ahead and give it some context. Down here on the x-axis, this was the fat in grams for each sandwich. And then let's go ahead and say which graph is which. I know I color code them here a little bit, but the bottom one, that was the beef. And we could say beef sandwiches at McDonald's. I'm just going to say beef for now. The top one, that was the fish sandwiches. Okay. So we've got the graphs. Now let's make some comparisons, right? Shape, outlier, center, spread, socks. So let's start with the shape. So neither one of these distributions are symmetric by any means. In fact, they both have high outliers. This is a little bit different than looking at a dot plot, but we can still pick up a few things. In fact, sometimes I like to think about a box plot as I'm looking at a dot plot uh, from above, right? I can't see how the dots, dots are stacked up, but I can see kind of where they would be stacked. For example, if there was a lot of dots right here, I wouldn't know how tall that was. Like if I'm in a helicopter, I'm looking down at the dot plot. It's one way to think about it. You can still see the outlier way out here. 
So for both distributions, they would have like kind of been symmetric if we covered up these two outliers, but these two outliers are pulling them to the right, so they both actually look like they're going to be right skewed. So there's shape. Um, how about center? If we have to make a comparison of center, that middle line in the box, that's the median. So which one has a higher center? Well, looks like beef. So we can say beef has a higher center, and we can actually back those up with values in this case. 26 grams, then fish, which is only 19 grams. So we've got shape, we've got center. How about spread? One of these is clearly more variable than the other. In fact, they both start at 9, but one goes all the way out to 43, while the, the other only goes out to 33. So the beef is definitely more variable or has greater spread. So it goes from 9 grams to 43 grams. Then the fish, that goes from 9 grams to 33 grams. And then the only other thing we should make mention of here is the outliers, since there are indeed outliers, and we actually calculated it. So we don't have to say there appears to be outliers. We can say for sure both distributions have outliers. The beef has one at 43 grams, and the fish has one at 33 grams. So I think that does it. Socks, we mentioned shape, outliers, center, and spread. Not necessarily in that order. All right, last bit for these notes. Start with Q1. What is a resistant measure? Is the mean a resistant measure of center? So for starters, a resistant measure is a measure that's not influenced by extreme values. And we said the mean is actually not a resistant measure at all. How can you estimate the mean of a histogram or dot plot? So the mean is actually somewhat of a balance point. So you can think about if the histogram or the dot plot was made out of solid material and you had to stick your finger out and balance it, the mean is the point you would actually balance at. Here's this really cool picture of a histogram. And if I could put my finger here, try to find the point where it would balance perfectly, that would be the mean. Now you can imagine if it was skewed right, I'm not going to run my finger over this way to the back. That's how we can kind of observe the mean by thinking about this thing as being solid and balancing it on a figure. Okay, Q3, is the median a resistant measure of center? So we know the mean's not a resistant measure of center, but is the median? Yes, the median is a resistant measure. It's the midpoint position, and it's not subject to extreme values. So the mean, we, actually, we have to actually calculate. So it accounts for all those extreme values. But the, the median, that's just a measure of position. Who's exactly in the middle? So it is resistant, right? Q4, how does the shape of a distribution affect the relationship between the mean and the median? So as far as if something's symmetric, like this one, this graph appears roughly symmetric, the mean is actually going to be about the same as the median. That's for a symmetric graph. But if it's right skewed, well, we know the mean is actually going to be bigger than the median. Because if it's right skewed, it's got some higher values to the right that would pull the value of the mean up. And on that same school of thought, if it's left skewed, the median is actually going to be bigger than the mean because the the smaller values to the left would actually pull our average down, which is our mean. So if symmetric, they're about the same. Right skew, the mean is actually going to be bigger than the median. Left skew, the median is bigger than the mean. Q5, what is the range? The range is actually really simple. You just do the max minus the min. So the highest value minus the lowest value. Is it a resistant measure of spread? Absolutely not. It's not a resistant measure. Extreme values can directly change the max or the min. And we saw that. Our max and mins might be outliers themselves. So the range could be a really big number based on our max and our min. So range is definitely not resistant. Q6, what are quartiles? How do you find them? So quartiles, think of that root word as being quarters. 
and we care about Q1 and Q3. So we can think of those as being fourths, one-fourths, or quarters. Um, we start with the median, right? We cut the data set in half, and then we cut the other two in half as well. So we cut the lower half in half, that's our first Q1, and we cut the upper half in half, that's our Q3. And we did that a couple times within these notes. And then Q7, I've already got it here. What's the interquartile range, a.k.a. IQR? Well, you just do the 75th percentile minus the 25th percentile. Another way to say that, Q3 minus Q1. That's IQR. Is the IQR a resistant measure of spread? Yeah, it actually is resistant. So it's resistant in the same way that the median's resistant. So Q3 and Q1, those are ways to track position, right? They measure position. Q3 and Q1, just like median measured position. So IQR, we're looking at the interquartile range, really comparing two positions. That's why they're also resistant. Whereas something like the mean, where we used a formula to calculate the average, that's really influenced by those extreme values of those outliers. IQR is resistant, just like the median was resistant. And then Q8, I'm going to leave that one to you. So that one is on your own, but I'll be checking that within these notes. So we talked about box plots. We talked about resistant measures of spread, non-resistant measures of spread. And we learned how to use our five-number summary. So that is all for these notes. I'll see you in class.